Hey there, everyone. Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. This is a special edition of The Final Bar here during a vacation week for your host. Uh, really thinking about the top 10 stocks or the top 10 charts uh, series that Grayson Rose and I have been doing now for, boy, about a year plus, I want to say. We sit together, uh, you know, once a month and uh, bring five charts each. We discuss them uh, as a uh, as a pair. We uh, you know put them up on the screen and sort of compare and contrast them and ask questions of each other. It's turned into a really fun part of our process and a really good opportunity to uh, compare notes with another investor and uh, and uh, and focus on the charts and the message we can get there. This is a three part series and this is part number two. So if you missed the first one, there's a link below. Make sure you start with the first one because that's where we actually talked about how we can identify top charts. Right? What's the process that we use? We talked about using the scanning engine. A couple different ways of identifying some charts that could deserve a spot in your own top 10 charts if you were doing your own exercise. Today, we're going to talk about uh, how we uh, monitor performance, how we track performance of these top performing names, something we're really not able to do in the specials that we do because we're sort of giving you the tickers and then we're moving on to other things. And so this is an opportunity for me to look back at some of the picks that we've made in the last couple months. We'll actually review the charts today, now in mid-July, and look at what's happened from when we selected them to this uh, to the uh, list and, uh, and what they're performing uh, today. And then the third series, which will be coming very, very soon, uh, we will talk about uh, how we manage risk. And I think the three of those together, how you identify candidates, how you track performance, and how you manage risk is really a giving you behind the scenes uh, view in terms of how we do the specials, but it's really more to encourage you and inspire you to think about your own process of identifying uh, potential candidates, of tracking their performance, and of managing risk in your own portfolio. So I hope you can take that step with us as, uh, as we go through the special. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at two lists of charts, and I'm going to start with the stocks that uh, and the charts that Grayson and I selected for our June special, which we broadcast uh, early in the month of June, and then we'll do the May uh, uh, special of the stocks that we picked uh, sort of end of April uh, to, uh, to broadcast in early May. And as we talked about in the last episode, you know, these are charts that we, Grayson and I are always looking at charts uh, for our own uh, routines, for our own investing, uh, but also, of course, for content that we provide out to Stock Charts users. Uh, and so we always have names that we're bringing up. But this particular exercise is an opportunity to kind of take a step back from the day to day and focus on actionable ideas. So how have we actual, actually done? So I'll be clear. I think one of the challenging things about doing this exercise every month now, having having uh, done it for a while with Grayson, is that we don't have a chance to actually track the performance you know, real time. In real life, if you add any sort of stock to your portfolio, in my opinion, you need to have a good risk management strategy or right? a good exit strategy that would tell you that whatever you've selected was not the right uh, answer and, uh, and and admit that you're wrong. Uh, so in the next episode, we'll talk about some risk management strategies I would use if I was taking positions in some of the charts that we've been uh, highlighting here. But let's look at the stocks that we selected for the June special. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at this chart list, which uh, if you've uh, seen the episodes and there's a link below to the episodes, and those episodes have links to these chart lists that I'm showing. So you're welcome to access the chart lists uh, on your own. And I hope if you're a Stock Charts member, you can save them to your own login, uh, make your own watch lists, of course. But we're looking at this chart list in performance view. And that's a great way to take a list of anything and just quick tabular uh, you know, uh, uh, view what's worked, what hasn't. And when I'm looking at a list of stocks or ETFs for the first time, I like to start here because it just sort of gives you a sense of where things are at. And then we're going to start looking at the charts one by one and talk about some, some specific points. But for now, we can see that, and I forget, by the way, who picked what. We'll see that by the charts in a, in a second here. But Oracle in the last month, now we picked this, uh, what, about a month ago? Um, uh, Oracle for the last month up about 18%. Bitwise Crypto uh, Innovators, that was one I know Grayson picked up about 6%. Robinhood up over 4%. Three of them were down in the last month. Take Two, probably the worst performer, down 9%. Crocs down over 2% uh, in, the, uh, in the last month. Let's look at the chart list view and actually look at these names one by one. So now I can tell by the charts, this is uh, what my charts look like. And just to be clear, because we'll look at a bunch of these here in this episode, my default chart has a two-year daily time frame with the 50 and 200-day moving averages. Then we have RSI, a measure of momentum, and then uh, relative strength, this, the uh, ticker divided by or a ratio of that ticker versus the S&P 500. And I should note, as you've probably seen if you've watched the specials that we've done, we often bring up other charts, right? So 
like the daily chart, and we'll bring up the weekly chart as well. But for simplicity here, we're just looking at the daily charts just so we have a, a good place to, uh, to uh, work from. This is what Grayson's charts will all look like. At the top, we have the relative performance of that ticker, whatever we selected, versus the uh, Vanguard Total Market Index. That's a, it's an ETF, ticker VTI, very similar to the S&P 500, but broader used list of, uh, of stocks to, uh, to compare against. And then the, uh, let's see, a one year, looks like a year and a half daily chart uh, with a candle chart. And then the 21, sorry, the 20 day EMA is dotted in blue. I'm looking up here at the legend, the 50 day moving average in red, the 100 day moving average is a dashed orange, the uh, 200 day moving average is a thicker green color. Uh, just so you understand uh, what we're looking at. So let's start with Crocs. So we actually talked about Crocs uh, here. And I remember when I selected this for the episode, it was because we were breaking to new highs and I highlighted Crocs as a uh, cup and handle pattern, which is a traditional pattern uh, really popularized by Bill O'Neill, founder of Investors Business Daily, where your stock has a really good run higher. And then this rounded bottoming pattern, a shallower pullback. So there's the cup and then the handle of the cup. And then the breakout is what you're looking for. So what's interesting is since we picked this, uh, you know, here, you broke a little bit higher, right? So we broke above the resistance around 145. We could get another 20 points higher to 165. Now we're pulling back to an ascending 50-day moving average. So based on where we're at, I would say this is probably still not bad of a chart. Yeah, I mean, I would love to tell you any charts that we highlight in these top 10 uh, specials that they would all immediately go up, but that's pretty unrealistic. There, you know, There's gonna be movements uh, uh, of any sort, right, to the upside or the downside. But I don't think this is a, a horrible chart uh, just yet. I would actually say the fact that we're pulling back to the 50-day moving average, which is in line with this pivot point here, uh, tells me it's still okay. And we've made a higher high. For now, we're making a higher low. And as long as we hold 143, 145 on this pullback, uh, that's okay. We break much lower, though. We break below the 50-day moving average. I'd probably um, start to look elsewhere and, and think about uh, better opportunities. But for now, probably holding up there okay, I would say. It wasn't too bad. All right, that's a decent start here. I was a little nervous because I, I don't look at these names uh, that closely. After we pick them, I'm moving on to other things. So this is actually a really fun exercise to go through these in a little more detail. This was one of Grayson's picks from that uh, round, the Natural Resources ETF, which is kind of a you know materials sort of uh, sort of ETF, I would say, generally speaking. Right here, here's where we were talking about it. Um, in April, we had the new swing high. We pulled back and going into the episode, you're sort of in this frame where it looked like the breakout level here. Here's the top of the base. We broke out back and then pulled back to that level. And I remember we talked about that pull back to a breakout level. And if you look, we had a nice move higher, right? Early May, we're actually pushing to the upside, uh, breaking slightly above there. But what strikes me about this chart in the month of June and now into early July is we never really followed through, right? We hit this resistance level and then stalled out, right? We never really got above that uh, above that point. And I think that was a telling uh, and very concerning uh, point for uh, for this particular chart. What you have to remember is as you're monitoring charts going on, right? When you when you say something is a buy or when you see, think something is a good uh, is a good chart, you think it's a good entry point, you continue to track it. And it, and I would argue that as long as that trend persists you're in good shape. When the trend is no longer in play, right? Or as Justin Mamis, who's a, a famous strategist and author famously said, like if stock doesn't do what you'd expect it to do, go find something else. Or and, and that was a horrible paraphrase of Justin Mamis's really thoughtful quote about basically you're betting on a particular pattern to emerge. And if that pattern does not emerge and or continue, then something different is at work here. And I think what's happened with natural resources since there is we've then undercut all of these moving averages, and I remember talking with uh, Grayson about the importance of holding the 20-day EMA, the 50-day simple moving average. I think the fact that we've broken all of those is probably more concerning. Now, we did bounce off of the 200-day moving average, but for now, until it gets back above the 50-day uh, and the 50-day turns higher, I probably think that that uh, was a busted chart with a major drawdown there uh, into mid-June. Western Digital, I remember talking about because it was a nice slow and steady uptrend, pulling back to an ascending 50-day moving average. That appears to be continuing. So that this is one of those where as long as the chart continues in the same pattern, in the same direction, there's no what I call a change of character. I think that's still a decent uh, chart that appears to be working uh, pretty well. 
BITQ, I remember Grayson uh, picking this one. This is an interesting chart because we're talking about it facing resistance. And if you look at what's happened, we actually have broken slightly above there, really haven't gone much further, right? So we sort of tested it here, pulled back, then we gapped above that resistance level. Um, and you can see that that level for now kind of is holding. We're sort of right at that point where, you know, as far as I could tell, the chart is still kind of working as long as that pattern of higher highs and higher lows continues. You'd want to see it get uh, above out of this sort of 1425, 1450 range, but still good. Boy, take two did not play out as we uh, as we suggested it might. I remember talking about this chart. This is one that I picked. And, you know, we sort of saw this pattern, right? The new 52 week high in February of this year pulled back, broke below the 200-day, found support around 140, 142, and then broke back higher. One of the things we talked about in the episode was the importance of getting to a new swing high. And I always, I always like to say it as, you don't want to trade to resistance, but through resistance. You want stocks that are able to eclipse a previous ceiling and demonstrate that new buyers are coming in or buyers are willing to take on risk above that price point. That did not happen. So that was sort of the trigger we were looking for was a break above 170. Didn't happen. And I think for now, you still have to be waiting to see if that uh, that breakout would emerge. Still an interesting chart above 170, but never really played out to that point. Robinhood was one of Grayson's names. And if you look, actually a really decent move uh, in, uh, in early June, sort of late May to early June was actually working pretty well. From there, it's sort of stabilized. I don't, this is one of those charts that I don't think of as bad yet, right? Because we're still making higher highs and higher lows, but we're sort of maybe making a lower high here. So it's sort of a consolidation phase. We're sort of settling in around 2250. So it doesn't look like a broken chart just yet. And I love the fact that here's resistance around 2050. That's about where we pull back to in early June, which means as long as we hold that, that's still actually a pretty pretty good chart. And I don't remember if we mentioned those levels in particular, but we probably did. Trade Desk, thumbs up on this one. This has actually worked kind of how you'd expect or how you'd hope because we broke out above a resistance level. We pulled back briefly and then June into July has been pretty strong. So TTD still looks like a decent chart to me. Oh, boy, this is the Web X.0. This is a um, uh, sort of one of the ARK funds that's not the ARK Innovation Fund, not ARKK, but ARKW. You know, really did not break out much uh, after the uh, episode that we're, uh, that we're referring to, which was our June episode, sort of in early mid-June. But we have pulled back and now starting to break out a little bit. I, w I would argue that the things we talked about here, sort of this consolidation and looking for a breakout, still maybe, you know, sort of evolving here. We did close above $80 a share, which is good. Um, and so I think as long as that trend continues, not too bad. Alcoa, boy, pulled back yet again. And I think what's great about the chart of Alcoa for me, big uh, rotation from a distribution phase to an accumulation phase. So pullback did break slightly below the 50-day moving average. But, you know, you see buyers come in on the pullbacks, uh, pullbacks, pulls back. I don't know what you'd say there. Pullbacks below the 50-day moving average. And uh, while not making a new 52-week high uh, just yet, um, certainly sort of rotating in that direction. So above two upward sloping moving averages, you know, a bit of a drawdown here, but overall I would say it's probably still uh, still okay. And then the last one was Oracle. Boy, big thumbs up. I mean, we gapped higher, traded up a little bit, pulled back to make a higher low around 137.50 and for now continuing to push to the upside. That's not too bad. I don't feel horrible about those charts. Those are pretty good, right? We'll take them. All right, let's look at the May episode. So these are the charts that we talked about. So what happens during these episodes is usually at the end of the month prior. So at the end of April, Grace and I are starting to put our notes together and uh, look at some charts. Then we sit down on some morning in Redmond and uh, and uh, share with each other the five charts we both picked. Uh, we both picked, and then we uh, we record the episode very quickly. And so these were names we were probably looking at in late April, and we published in early May as part of that episode. And again, hopefully I remember to put the uh, the links to these episodes below, so you can go back to the review them, see what we actually talked about. And again, the point of this episode is to you know think not just about what we talked about, what's happened since we picked them. So these are stocks we were looking at in early May. We're now in early July. How have the last two months been? Well, for the last one month. You can see we have applied materials up the most over 8%. Truist is a regional bank. That's up uh, almost 5%. Billy, Billy, Morgan, Stanley, both up over 2%. Four of these 10 charts were down in the last month. Agilent down over 5%. Tractor Supply Crocs, I picked two months in a row, I think. Or we as a team picked two months in a row. I forget if we both did, but I think that was me both times. 
All right, let's look at the um, look at the charts here. So again, the idea here is to just think about what's happened from when we selected them to what's happened now. We'll start with Truist, which was my first uh, pick apparently uh, for the uh, for the May episode. So we're kind of here, and, I, and and as I'm looking at this chart, I remember what I was looking for, which was we were just breaking above. Uh, the um, the swing high, right? So we had this resistance around 37, 38, 50, and then we finally broke above here in early May. It certainly looked like a big push higher. You know, from there, I would say the interest rate environment has gotten a little uh, little different. You've seen rates come down a bit, uh, and uh, the regional banks, which looked really really strong in mid May, early mid May, sort of rotated lower. This one breaking below the 50 day moving average. Uh, the momentum going low, so the R side dipping below 40 probably would have gotten me out of this uh, right around here. You know, and again, I'm you sort of when you buy breakouts, and again, this is sort of uh, teasing what we might talk about in the uh, in the the next episode, talking about risk management. But you know, what I I would say is when you're buying breakouts you really have to think about an exit strategy because you're buying a breakout assuming that the thing's going to keep going higher, which happens a lot, in which case you're great and you just keep riding it and riding it. But when it doesn't break out, you need to make sure that you limit your losses because a failed breakout can get very painful very quickly. So while it might end up working, I'd much rather look for a, a new breakout that is a better setup today and see if that's the opportunity to ride it higher. So this one probably I would have gotten stopped out before uh, today. We're still sort of bumping up against that same 40 level. So at this point, I'd probably look to re-enter if we get above 40, if I'm thinking of this as a position. Uh, I don't have a position in any of these charts as far as I know, uh, but that's how I would probably think of that there. Boy, EMQQ did not work at all, did it? It worked a little bit, but not much here. This is early May. We talked about it here. Grayson talked about this one you know, breaking out and it sure did. I mean, look at this exponential rise that you had. It went from, you know, around $32 a share to almost $37 a share um, in uh, in just a couple of weeks. It was a really brilliant rise into, uh, into the third week in May. And then from there, you have a gap lower and then a run down. That gap is an interesting one. You'd call that gap, um, you know, usually call that a breakaway gap, which is, you know, the first gap in a new direction. So you gap after a big run higher, you have a big gap lower. And that usually a lot of times will mean that whatever was getting everyone excited on the left side of that run, the gap down is sort of a big reset where everyone that bought up here all of a sudden gets really nervous and then a lot more selling happens because everyone's just trying to get out and lock in those gains. And you can see the big uh, heavy candles that happen soon after that gap. That certainly looks like what played out uh, here. And at this point, the chart is below, I mean, briefly below the tw uh, 20 day EMA here. Uh, but now below the 50-day moving average in red. And I would say at this point, that chart is no longer working. I think that gap down after the big run would have been a big warning uh, for me. Billy Billy is a Chinese internet name. And boy, not bad since we talked about it. I remember highlighting this as a uh, break back above the 200-day moving average. And look at what's happened. I think from there, it's just made a really nice rotation from a distribution phase of lower lows and lower highs to more of an accumulation phase of higher highs and higher lows. Right now we're pulling back to an ascending 50-day moving average and momentum is strong. I would say Billy Billy's worked out just fine. Take that one. Apply Materials, good pick, Grayson. This was one that he selected here. And I remember talking about this uh, particular range, sort of 213 to 215. This was resistance in March and April. We we're just starting to break above there. Look, we broke above. Look at these candles right here with these long lower shadows, probably call these hammer candles, uh, right above the 50-day moving average, right at the breakout level, really suggests further upside. I think that was a really nice selection for this uh, this list of names. Well done. This is when I picked Alamos Gold. Uh, what's interesting is this week, actually, a lot of the gold stocks are popping higher. As gold's bouncing uh, back uh, back upwards toward 2,300 uh, an ounce. Um, you can see gold stocks like Newmont Mining having a really decent week. Alamos Gold AGI, which is when I picked, uh, popped up here. You know, we were talking about it back here as it was breaking to new highs, right? We've pulled back to the 50-day, broke below it a little bit, but hanging in there, okay. And I think this is really telling on the chart of uh, gold. Uh, Alamos Gold, that is, is that the RSI pulled back to 40 and sort of holding. So I would say at this point, that chart's still uh, okay. Agilent Technologies did not work very well. This was one that we talked about because it was breaking above resistance. And again, as we talked about with a couple charts ago, 
Anytime you're buying a breakout, you just have to be prepared that some breakouts will work really well, in which case you need to stick with them. When breakouts do not work well, you want to get out of the way. And Peter Lynch, you know, and I'll par paraphrase a Peter Lynch quote, but it was, you know, it's not about being right all the time. It's when you're right, staying right. And when you're wrong, admitting you're wrong. He said something along those lines. I've paraphrased it to that, I think, uh, enough. But, you know, basically, if you're expecting a breakout and the breakout doesn't materialize right in here, I'd probably be thinking, all right, that's that was not the breakout that I had uh, sort of sketched out in my mind. I take uh, I, I get out of the way and then you can see this painful gap down. If you're still holding it at that point, um, you know, you're, you're probably really, really struggling. And what's happened here is we found support at these hammer candles here. We, we bounced off of the 200 day, but. Over the last couple of weeks, we've now broken below. So I would say this is the type of chart you probably got stopped out on, uh, which is, again, when, when you get stopped out, I get people that ask me, oh, I got stopped out. What what didn't go right? Like, what did I do wrong? And my answer is you did nothing wrong, right? If you got stopped out and you limited your losses, you did great. That means your money management strategy is thumbs up. Awesome. You're going to be wrong, right? Admitting you're wrong and unwinding it is so important. Here's Crocs, which since we've talked about it, has actually continued upwards, got up to 165 from one, you know, 125, which is not bad in the month of May into mid-June. Now we're pulling back a little bit to an ascending 50-day moving average. This is actually one that I just wrote about this week because I think it's right at that point, right? If this is a nice longer-term uptrend, we're kind of at the point where you'd expect support to hold. But if not, I think that could be dangerous. Maybe we head further down to the 200-day uh, moving average. Morgan Stanley right worked a little bit here in mid May, but then came back down to an ascending 50 day moving average. I don't I don't think this is one that didn't work. I mean, this is actually still holding that level of support. OK, if it gets below the 50 day, I would be a lot more concerned. But right at one hundred dollars a share, which is a big round number, which is one I'd probably look for. Boy, tractor supply worked really well here. Then I remember picking this one because it was a nice uh, rally pulled back to it, a 50 day moving average and rotating higher. And on these types of charts, what I like to say, as long as we're above two upward sloping moving averages. It's great. So that has worked really well up to around 290. What's happened in the last month, though, actually the last couple weeks, we are now below the 50 day moving average. We broke below it, traded up to it and then continued. So in my opinion, that is now a broken uptrend. You reassess and I'd probably be looking down somewhere in the 235 to 240 range, which would be the 200 day and the April swing low as an opportunity to like re-enter a position. But for now, I would say did not uh, no longer in a uh, in a decent uptrend. This was the on share, online retail ETF, ONLN, that I remember Grace and I talked about in uh, May. And again, nice breakout. From there, it sort of pulled back. And I probably loosely label this a bull flag pattern, which is when you have a run, you have this sort of pullback, a parallel decline of lower highs and lower lows. And you look for it to break out of that range, which it's almost doing right now. So as long as that 50-day holds, I think this is in interesting chart it's you know so you've given it back a little bit since mid-may but uh, overall not uh, broken just yet it's interesting it's a really interesting exercise uh, of uh, I'm, I'm thinking having so many thoughts about this i i want to do this more often i hope we have the opportunity to do so we talked about doing this uh this series of three episodes while i was on vacation this week and i'm uh, i'm really enjoying this process of going back thinking about what we talked about a month, two months ago, thinking about what's happened after then. And again, I, I mean, hopefully what this illustrates is with any sort of stock picking or technical analysis, you're not going to be right all the time. You're actually going to be wrong a lot more than you probably want. But the reality is that is the nature of investing and being a successful investor is not about being right every time. It's about when you're right, staying right and continuing to log those gains as trends persist. And when you're wrong, getting out of the way, making sure you have a good money management strategy. So if this exercise was interesting to you, make sure you tune into the next one, the third in our three-part series, te teasing out these uh, top charts that we select every month, where we will talk about risk management, some of the specific tools that I would be using to manage risk if you were taking positions on some of the charts that we talked about. But for now, we'll leave it there. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Have a fantastic week. We'll be back with the uh, regular programming next week. But until then, be well, stay safe, have a good one.